So, today I'm here to talk about rules or common agreements. So, first question is, why do we even create this sort of thing? Well, basically we want to live together, right? It's a community and in certain communities, in small or bigger, we discuss and say, I like this and I like the orange and I like the pink, but how, how, how are these basic things that we can do so we all can feel better living together? This is where we come up with those common agreements. I will give you an example. In my house, I live with George. George, that happens to be a cat, by nature likes a lot birds like this dove with the arrow on it and when in the spring not like an owl the birds start coming and they are super hungry so i feed them i live in front of a park they're here all the time i feel they're hungry i just feed them and george of course wants to play with them but when he plays they get hurt so it's not cool then we got together me, the birds, George, I got, let's, no, we need an agreement here, this is not working. So the deal is, George, you cannot eat the birds nor try to play with them because they get hurt. But you, you get cookies and then the birds are happy, I am happy, George, George not so much, but he's also happy. But he's like, a, but I was in the window and I always scare them when I get too pissed, okay? Otherwise, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not, and I would try to stand, but I would not touch them. Cool, we have an agreement. But why? Why do we even follow such rules? I got the feeling that most of them, to be honest, it's a merely uh, convenience or. We do not even think about it, or it's just we think it's just a bit logical. For example, in the most of the Western places, we tend to form lines. There's this love for lines, and no one likes it, but it works. And if I wake up in the morning and I just want a warm bread, I just there's five different people. We kind of understand who arrived first, and we form a line and wait, and we kind of know the time we will get there. It's not a rule, but it's kind of a best practice per se. I, of course, uh, don't need to follow this, but it will take me a lot of energy and we can just say, no, I don't want line and we can get a group and reinvent this best thing that will work for everyone. Sometimes it is necessary to not to follow this route. Then you know what? Break it, smash it. <laughs> I am the first one to raise my hand and say, please reinvent this rule. This is not working. Just like uh, Mr. Duro uh, wrote in his fabulous Resistance to Civil Government book, as known as AKA Civil Disobedience. And disobedience is great. It's awesome. This is why, for example, we have open source, right? Uh, open source was started, was born when someone defied a rule, say, no, 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 I don't, I don't want copyright. I don't want this law by that is by default to exist. I want to create my own law and have the right to allow others to copy, distribute, modify this code. Beautiful. But whoa, what is, what is open source? Well, one could say that open source is a very technical definition about source code that it's open, again, to copy, modify and distribute, traditional by the book. Others, by the other hand, may defend that before you even think about open source, you have to participate and understand what collaboration means, what it means to collaborate, this is the basic. So start to get together the open with the collaboration principles. I understand it's because open source is not a verb, not one thing. 
It can be a workflow, a philosophy that indeed went way over just code and approach, of course, to software development. It's definitely way much more than just hitting push, push and public into a public repository. My personal definition is that open source is an ecosystem. And by ecosystem, um, that means that it's composed not by one thing, it's by technical things like code, but mostly by people, the ones who are writing the code or doing other things that it's just not code. Every project shall have its own tribalistic culture and probably they will have its social norms. And just like the placing the code into this public repository will not achieve this idea of being shareable, uh, being open means that I'm open to the other. This one I do not know, it's not me. And this other should be able to participate somehow in the project. That's the meaning and the idea of open, right? But people are very, very complex. Independent of your definition, what you want to, yeah, how do you think about open source? Can we agree in one thing? I mean, to think about open source is to think about sharing and having this property of enabling sharing. But to share, we need to communicate something. And this is another very complex human thing, communication. If you think about communication theory, for example, you need someone giving the message and someone receiving the message with a medium that we'll get in between. In this case, like the ear, the sound, the voice, my brain receiving the mouth. So there's the message, the emitter, the, uh, and the ones receiving it, and the medium in between. This is basic theory. Have you ever played, like uh, to make it more uh, explicit, have you ever played this child's play called the broken telephone? There is other names for it. But basically you have someone just like in the picture, you spread, you whisper something, and then the other will hear and will pass along to the next, to the next, to the next, and to the end. And then the fun part is that the first one will compare with the last one. And it's it is super fun when they are not the same. And I mean, if you said in the beginning, I want to play with George, and at the end I hear, I want to uh, kick George, I would be super mad, super, super mad, but then you just wanted to play, right? So it's not fun when the noise happens in some circumstances, right? What? Well, this is noise, I guess, but this we're talking about its last well, one of the theories, right? We could use the, this, this person there. Communication, message, medium, receiver, the effect it calls. This was like a, um, an image for that. And this is linear. And you got into this whole complexity. No one understanding anything. George, it happened something to him that we don't know what happened. Noise. But an open source project, it's not linear. And usually there are several messages coming from all around asynchronously. And then, whoa, how? How can you imagine? So we give this example of just this linear, really control thing. But in open source, that's not this controlled. It's very basically the centralized thing most of the time or partially. One other way to explain or try to think about it, it's McLuhan. McLuhan is a Canadian philosopher. It's one of the cornerstones of media theory. And there is this really famous phrase from him where he says, the medium is the message. Well, it could be, in that case, the whisper. The whisper is by default something that it's not clear, loud, and it's meant to be a little disturbing. 
But he also said that the medium is the massage. And what does he mean by that? By massage, um, he meant uh, to denote uh, the effect of numerous medias and how they massage the human sensorium. He's talking not about uh, the proper content, but all the surroundings and how we are perceiving. Um, because humans are made of several types of perceptions. We're not only reading or not only hearing or not even the something in between that we haven't named yet or will never do. So not only the message comes to play, but also how this message is sent. That would be a little bit more complex. And then we have other theories. There's Berlos, but there's many others. And in Berlo, for example, you see that the source comes from many places, from attitude, from knowledge, and the message, and you have the element, the treatment, you have a coding, you have the channel, and this channel can be uh, smiling or yelling, and you have uh, how am I receiving this, which culture do I come from, may influence this perception, for example. And this is interesting to note, especially in open source, because one of the challenges of open source is dealing with information imbalance. Let's take this image, for example. Here you have a case of a doctor that contains some information like, hey, it's free, free data, use it, all there. But if I do not have this specifically knowledge uh, of before, this it's creating a symmetry of knowledge where only me who detains the, the coolness, the, uh, the knowledge can actually understand or decipher this uh, data, this information, and that's information imbalance. What happened is that we, of course, by nature, like a I can have my pit maintainer and just hand a signal message and say, yo, let's do that, cool. But what about all the other people that wants to contribute? So think about this wall. We have this closed wall, but what is after, behind this wall? We should make um, have mechanisms or ways to communicate in a way that everyone is in equal footing in, access, in terms of access to information and the ability also to influentiate this project. Otherwise, why would that be open, right? And that could be in a number of ways, procedural and daily communication and long term. What do I mean by that? Procedural is like the way we do things. For example, having one public issue tracker instead of having two different ones, a very close and a very open. The other one is how are we meeting and then making this available for people to have a chance to sit on the table and having a proper discussion about the changes that, in its opinion, needs to be made. And on daily communication is the basic stuff, like uh, how is the status? Is this just a proof of concept? It's been actually becoming active? Is that deprecated? Or things just like, uh, how do I even submit an issue? This is daily worries. Or long-term long communication, like uh, how well is documented? Because I just arrived. I want to start now, but I don't know where you, where, where you are, you project. So can I have a roadmap or understanding the philosophy so I can get in and already know kind of the social norms and where we are standing at the moment, for example? Just like open source, it's not equal, just a, a repository with open available code is all of this ecosystem, right? And working asynchronously, it's a um, very big characteristic of open source. This is another reason for as much as possible, although we do have this um, interesting, creative, uh, yeah, disobedience inside of us, as clear as possible, having some best practices, it is a cool thing in this case. So, part two. We already understand why does the rules are there for, right? I think, I think, yeah, I think so. I, I hope we convinced you enough. 
But can you imagine how can you apply all these rules if you're maintaining or overseeing or making sure hundreds, dozens or hundreds of repositories are healthy, are having this clear communication? This is crazy. And uh, we understand that maintainers need to be multitasking. Maintainers, uh, it's, yeah, are the ones who are being part of the project. And being part, it's not only having awesome, really cool, clear code, it's having, um, taking care of the community, taking care of the engagement, participating, collaborating, <laughs> governance, it's like a, this um, tons of tasks. It is a lot of work and a lot of interwoven work. And uh, more recently, there's also someone else in the game, which are the OSPOs, the open source program office. Those are the ones that, yeah, uh, they have to take care of a lot of places and a lot of places has to be really healthy because OSPOs main thing is to make sure um, the organization's repositories are healthy and aligned with the company's strategies. And this is why Check My Repo was created Yay! to make sure that uh, we're helping you to have healthy repositories. What, what are we talking about? I'll show you. This is Check My Repo. It is designed to be uh, as uh, neutral as possible, so more like RGB colors, uh, dark mode, high contrast, complying with accessibility using view acts uh, check from Decky. So uh, it is made to be a website that you can just fork and use it and call your own. It does use um, GitHub Actions behind. So you just grab your repository and <laughs> link it all and make sure it is complying with open source best practices. It is built with a Ripple Linter, which is another open source project maintained by To Do Group, which is super important for the open source community. And that's what it does. It just looks like a ah, do you have this that make this code more clean? Do you have this and this? But what are this? What are this thing I'm talking about? Those are some rules that we expect. Uh, or best practice that we expect all the repositories to have. And uh, uh, before I get into what each rule does and why they're important, I just uh, want to say that this is automated. This is why I use like a GitHub Actions for it, because we used to have in my department, I am from uh, South Lab Open Source Program Office Department. And before we create that, we used to do that by hand using an classic Excel spreadsheet. And it was cool for a while, but we supervise, we make sure the repositories are healthy. We do not maintain them per se. So one day we have it all updated and the next day, maybe all they're gone or do you have 200 other rules failing because they just change everything, which is their freedom to choose, right? This is why automation is so helpful. It makes this multitasking complex word effortless and makes you uh, with much more tools to being able to act upon what it's failing and what you need to do to improve your organization repositories. So let's take a look on the rules. Uh, Check My Repo uses by default 11 rules. And uh, we create those badges. Uh, if you go to the website, which is uh, like a bit, it's three badges in three priorities. The high ones are the red ones. Let's take a look on what I consider them. Of course, you can choose it, but uh, danger. Those are the dangerous one. First of all is the binaries. It's the security rule. It looks for binary files, executables, and passwords, which of course should not, for security reasons, contain in an open source project. The other one is license because compliance with open source software requirements, it's so necessary. And most of the projects are composed by several open source, which has had each one its own uh, license and things can get crazy, this mixing and matching. 
That's why when you insure, you already tell your user in advance the permission, the permissions allowed or not to do as a um, it's essential for you to use it, but also to protect you, maintainer, legally. So this is why licenses, the first thing cool to have in a project. The other one is the README. It's like this entrance door to your project, where it's like, a, hi, hello, welcome. This is what, it's not only how, um, what is written, but how is written. So this README, when it's welcoming and giving you all the primary information you need to know, the best your project will be. And that will be like the highly recommended first high super do not have a project without that. And then when you have time, because it's all about balance, right? You have the medium budget. Medium, not because they're less important, but because without them, you can kind of have an okay-ish, but that will, of course, make your project be much more welcome and easier for people to contribute. Change log, for example, makes it way much easier for people to understand the actual development state or if it's lacking lots of maintenance and they decided to go for it or not. The check my repo will look either for a document that say change log or if it has a release, release tag on GitHub. The contributing guideline, oh, this is my favorite because it's like a guiding hand. It will tell you hopefully very didactically all the resources how do you do it how do you start step by step is a guiding hand for the eager contributor the ownership is how do you search for who own the things so then you can get in touch and make decisions propose things and the test directory is what helps a lot your project to keep a good code uh, without breaks and with avoiding lots of regressions helps you assure your digital confidence of your project and of course your user satisfaction makes sense right and what about what i say low well it's not low because it doesn't matter but it's like those very nice birds in the background they are super good to have they harmonize the things and for example the code of conduct it's not that the project cannot exist with, but it will surely avoid lots of headaches and dramas and telenovelas, which I do like, but it will avoid lots of them if you just keep it by default. Yay, no. You cannot kick George, for example. It's my cat. You cannot do something else than love him, for example. Right? Yeah. So that also fosters a welcoming community because me, if I'm very introvert or I don't know what happens in my life before, I can have my own traumas. And if it is state that this project protects me from that, of course, I will feel welcome. License on README. Uh, license, it is valid if it's just on the README, but if you have a file and also it's a nice to have in the README because again, it's your open door. It's where everything you need to know it's there. Security is where it's like a, your Ah, emergency button, help! Which is very easy to find and you can easily act upon something needs to be done in an emergency case. And the support file, it's what describe uh, the, um, basically how can the user get help? So how can I be supported? Which communication channels? And avoiding lots of noise on that. Uh, cool, those are basically the rules and we're getting almost to the last part. So how to, how to, and I will show you a live demo. Ha <laughs> ha, literally, fork it. You fork into your repository and then you go to settings. In settings, you enable actions. Sometimes just click there is not enough, but you just check uh, after, yeah, yeah, you just check if they are, make sure it is allowed. You tell the deployment to happen using the GitHub pages and voila, you have a check my report to call your on. 
And um, the first time you do it, you will see there is there is still source labs information on it. It's because GitHub Actions, it's set up to run on and redeploy every time you do a push to main or in cron zero zero time, average kind of a midnight. So it may take a little, little while to see your actual information there. And I thank you all so, so much for spending this time with us. Um, if you have any doubts or would like to contribute, you're obviously welcome. I am Paloma Oliveira, probably part of Open Source Program Office and Source Labs. And if you check, if you like it, but you want to change a few things, you're, it's open. Call your honor, check my repo. In the contribution guidelines, there's the guides on how can you put more rules, less rules, change the colors, change the badges, and do the adjust adjustments enough, but it should all be simple and well described, trying to make it as clear and less noisy as possible for you. And I thank you all a lot. <laughs>